Welcome back, Vintage Watch fans. You're watching the Vintage Watch Guy. If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe below. Now today I'm going to start off a new series I'm calling 5-Minute Watch Reviews. Not sure if I'll be able to stick to 5 minutes, but uh, the idea is I'm going to use that method I described in my other video, Assessing a Vintage Watch, the Watch me Method, uh, W-A-T-C-H, and, uh, and show you some watches and go over what they're all about. I decided to start off with an easily identifiable watch. Um, if you take a look at this, this is what people call an Omega Soccer Timer. Now, we start with the W on wrist. The watch is uh, 38 uh, millimeters in diameter. Uh, however, it does have this cushion case so it wears a little bit larger on the wrist than a 38 millimeter. Some people say it wears more like a 40 millimeter. I have it on this racing strap. These kind of racing straps, you see different kinds. This is the one with the uh, smaller perforations. There's also ones that come with uh, larger holes you might have seen. And this watch is from, I gotta give the shout out to the Biblenist. Uh, I like his straps. For this strap with this Blue color, I think it really makes the dial pop. And uh, the right strap, right pairing, especially when you have some colors on your watch, I think makes a big difference. So I have to also give a shout out to Shane Griffin uh, from Wound for Life, Lessons in Wristry. Uh, has an excellent article on the Omega Soccer Timer describing the different variations. Uh, this particular one is uh, 145.016. You can see when you look at it, it's a Seamaster series. Uh, the soccer timer is so named because it was uh, given to soccer referees. And there's a normally, a, this in this movement, there's normally a 30 uh, minute counter here. Uh, the 30 minute counter, you see there's an extra line here. So when you go all the way around 30 minutes, you get to, uh, you do another 15 minutes, you get to 45. And that's the time a half uh, of a soccer match. So, you know, when you look at the soccer timers, you know, you compare it to other varieties, there's some more uh, complex varieties. The, there's a sort of medium variety, uh, which this is the most simple one. There's a medium variety, which has an internal tachymeter scale. And then there's the most complex variety, which has a uh, rotating internal tachymeter scale with uh, an extra, uh, extra crown here that rotates the internal bezel. The ones that have uh, a, multi a colorful internal rotating bezel are called uh, roulette wheel ones. Uh, you also find this in the Omega Chronostop series, which isn't uh, a full chronograph like this. It's a sort of simplified version of this movement. Um, but roulette wheels, because of their distinctive styling and larger size, are generally considered more desirable and may fetch a premium. Now, in terms of antiquity, this watch uh, came out in 1969. Uh, it was around in the early to mid 70s. 1969 was an important year all over the world, uh, but within watches it was a very momentous year as well. In 1969 is very well remembered for uh, the automatic chronograph. <clears throat> there were a few of these that came out all in that year, which sort of argue about which one was first. There was the Caliper 11, which was a consortium of Hoyer, uh, Breitling, Interestingly enough, Hoyer and Breitling did not overlap uh, that much because Breitling sold mostly uh, pilot-oriented watches like the Navitimer. Uh, Hoyer sold mostly racing-oriented watches. Uh, the Hoyer was more popular uh, in the United States. Breitling was more popular in Europe, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't remember. Uh, but they both were known for chronographs, and they both collaborated on this project. Um, Buren, later bought by Hamilton, also was involved in this project as well. Hamilton became involved when they purchased Buren. And Dubois du Prav, uh, I'm not, probably not pronouncing that right, but the uh, chronograph module maker, uh, they were all involved. And the Caliber 11 was a modular uh, chronograph, automatic lined. There's also the uh, Seiko 6139. Uh, that's a vertical clutch column wheel movement made by Seiko. Uh, which doesn't have any running seconds. Uh, that was first sold in Japan, so it didn't get as, quite as much attention as the Caliber 11. 
Uh, caliber 11s also have the uh, winding crown on the left side of the movement, uh, so they do have a very distinctive appearance. Uh, and then there's also, of course, the El Primero, uh, beautiful movement, uh, rat high beat, high beat movement later. The El Primero movement, many years later, was incorporated to the Zenith-based uh, Rolex Daytonas. Uh, it's become sort of a legendary movement, and they let you know. They, the Zenith thought it was the first current automatic chronograph because they called it the El Primero. It was also momentous here because the launch of the Seiko, Ast Seiko Astron in 1969 uh, in December was the sort of defining event that set off the quartz crisis. So when you look at chronograph, when you look at watches, especially chronographs from 1969, uh, it's an interesting year because that was sort of the last hurrah of the Swiss watch industry before the quartz crisis started to set in. And it was also an interesting time in terms of design. You know, Woodstock was going on. There were a lot of bright colors. You know, it really, six, the late 60s sort of launched the, um, a very distinctive uh, design period uh, involving larger sizes, cushion cases, uh, sunburst uh, finishing, uh, colorful, uh, colorful designs. They're very characteristic of this period as in contrast to the uh, earlier 60s and the 50s where the watches were smaller, um, the designs were uh, more conservative, uh, there was more gold watches, and there weren't as many colors. Another interesting thing about Omega particularly is that the Omega Memomatic was launched in 1969, and that was a the, the, the first automatic uh, winding both movement and alarm uh, also had a rapid uh, date change and so you know that was sort of a last hurrah for the alarm watch you might say of course 1969 was also the year of the moon landing which was proved very momentous for omega as well and so in terms of that's a for antiquity now in terms of t time does it work uh, when i look at this when i looked at this watch you do a wind and if you can hear that Beautiful wine. This is an Omega uh, eight six uh, Omega eight six one movement, same movement that was deployed in the Moon Watch, and the descendant of which is in the Moon Watch uh, today. Um, the chronograph start. It's a, a cam based chron chronograph. I would say out of different cam based chronographs. It has the smoothest operation, the crispest pushers. Uh, to me, it feels very similar to a column wheel. Um, I don't really notice much of a difference between the, the Lamania-based um, 861 uh, movements compared to, um, compared to, for example, Valjoux 7730, uh, 7734 series, or uh, 7750-based ones that we see today, or compared to um, other cam-based systems, I find that the Alemannia uh, made A61 uh, chronographs from Omega are particularly crisp. And when I have a when I have a chronograph like this, I always let it run past the minute uh, because it puts a lot of pressure on the movement to jump the minute hand forward, and you can see that it ticks forward perfectly. Some chronographs. Uh, if they're running a bit slow, if they're, the main spring is worn out, the, you, you'll see that the minute hand won't jump forward. And another way you can tell an A61 is that you stop it and restart it in sort of the typical way that we would think. And uh, so it works. Uh, the case. The case, you know, the original ones of these had uh, very distinct lines. There's a sunburst finish. You can just sort of detect a trace of it here, but there was a sunburst finish around the edges, very uh, late 60s, early 70s to mid 70s. There's a bevel here. Uh, this part of the case was black polished. Should be an original Omega crown. You see it's uh, a bit on the large side. This is a manual wine movement after all. And there should be a Sea Master logo on the back with the uh, the Sea Monster. So you can see that the logo is still very crisp. 
but the case, you know, it's been polished. You can see that the edges aren't quite as uh, sharp as you might like. Um, but because it's a less commonly found Omega and the dial is perfect, you know, I, uh, I do think it's a very beautiful watch. I did see an example that after I bought this one several months later that it was perfectly crisp, but uh, I think I wanted about more than double what I paid for this one, so I decided it was not worth it. In terms of how much, um, you know, the I don't want to go into that in these segments because the market is always changing. I don't want to set a reference point. Um, but there you go. These are this is an Omega Seamaster Soccer Timer. A very beautiful and distinctive watch. Hey, right, thanks for your time. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe below. Again, I'm the Vintage Watch Guy. And I will see you in the next one.